Hello, everybody. We are Team CalSound, and we formed out of a partnership between the Conservation and Technology Track, the Fung Fellowship, as well as the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So before we get started, I just want to take a little bit of time to introduce our team members, as well as our individual roles on the project. So we have Didi, Justin, and Audrey, who worked on the literature review. We have Lena, Edgar, and Anmol, who led our tech part of the project. And then finally, Sinducho and I worked on the designs. So in our presentation, we will quickly summarize the scope of our problem and discuss our mission. Then we will move on to presenting the prototype as well as all the steps that we took to get there. And then finally, we will discuss the risks and the next steps of our project. So first, um, we will delve into some background about soundscapes. Soundscapes consist of biological, anthropogenic, and geological sounds. Biological sounds are created by marine organisms, and that includes whales, crustaceans, and fish. Anthropogenic sounds are man-made and include sounds produced by seal guns, vessels, oil drilling sites, or offshore wind turbines, um, and many more. And then finally, geological sounds include non-biological sounds, such as wind, rain, thunder, and earthquakes. So in order to really understand the impact of ocean noise, um, on the next slide, it is crucial to establish, one, the baseline conditions of natural soundscapes, two, understand the impact that man-made noises have on animals as well as their behavior, and three, quantify how soundscapes are changing over time. And while soundscapes are widely used in terrestrial ecosystems, they are not as widely employed in marine ecosystems. And for this reason, marine resource managers need a centralized source of soundscape information in order to make well-informed decisions. So this is where we come in and how we formed our how might we question. How might we help marine resource managers, researchers, policymakers, and the general public see the impacts of noise pollution in the ocean and provide a clear holistic way of synthesizing information and visualizing ocean soundscapes. I'll now pass it on to Audrey, who will talk about our steps, our prototyping steps. Here we have a timeline of the steps we took throughout our project process. We started as a full team researching the field of soundscapes, working on an initial draft of the literature review and performing interviews. From there, we then split into sub teams working in parallel to complete the literature review and develop a Figma prototype, which then evolved into our current website. Next slide, please, thank you. Our first step was to start with research, which we used as an opportunity to better inform ourselves of the complex complexities of soundscape. We divided 30 academic papers from the categories listed on the slide among ourselves so that we each read through before presenting our paper's main takeaways and relevance to our project. From there, the summaries of each paper were combined to create our 31-page literature review. Our paper's main value stems from the fact that it provides a comprehensive review of the soundscapes and its applications, both of which are novel ideas. Our paper also has a section in which we discuss how the technology in this field, including our prototype, is evolving and can better serve marine resource managers and other stakeholders. In addition to providing our literature review to NOAA to be shared with their stakeholders, we've included it on our website so that we can increase the accessibility of soundscape knowledge to all users. Next, we split into pairs to interview 12 marine resource managers, policymakers, researchers, and technology experts to discuss how soundscapes fit into their line of work. After each team completed their interviews and shared what they learned, we formed three main takeaways. Our first takeaway is that research is not centralized, focusing more on the individual species rather than the entire ecosystem. This then causes policy, which is built off of research to only focus on the individual species. Our second takeaway is that there are many different metrics to consider when understanding the impact of sound, such as broadband and third octave levels. Additionally, it is important to acknowledge temporal and spatial scales since they can greatly affect the data collected and the metrics produced. Utilizing all of these factors allows scientists to identify how soundscape levels differ from what is deemed normal. Our third takeaway is that it is vital to consider all the layers within a soundscape, including the biological, geological, and anthropogenic sounds. These layers provide the context needed to understand how human and biological activities intersect and impact the local ecosystem. So from what we learned during our interviews, we were able to develop a stakeholder analysis which mapped out how to best serve our users as well as how stakeholders interact. First, researchers communicate both with marine resource managers and policymakers to share the data they've collected. From there, marine resource managers utilize the data to develop their plans while policymakers um, use that data to establish regulations to protect the environment. Our team serves as the middlemen in the data sharing process. 
By taking the data collected by researchers and producing a comprehensive visualization of that data, we provide the opportunity to marine resource managers and policymakers to understand the concept of the data in the ecosystem. This increases the efficiency of data analysis and application since many organizations do not have the capacity to analyze the data they receive from the researchers. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Anmol so that he can introduce our prototype through our user story. The best way to really understand our prototype is through actually working, working through some of the features in the form of a user story. And so if you'd, love, if you'd like to follow along, one of my teammates will post a link to our website in the chat so you can do that. But the setting is that pretend you are a manager at the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, also known as BOEM and you're responsible for planning and monitoring off the development of offshore wind farms on the coast of California. Now, in order to decide where you should build these wind farms and also if you should build these wind farms, you need to know two things. First, you need to be able to understand the baseline sound levels of the areas where you're looking to develop. And then also you need to be able to predict the impact of your development on the species in the area and make sure you're not violating any policy requirements and also not adversely harming the, the biology in, the, in, the, in that ge geography. And so from here, the user would go to the map on our website. And here they'll see a lot of uh, several, several buoys. And so all the sound data was collected when NOAA in 2018 put microphones in the, in the ocean attached to drifting buoys and recorded audio. And so if we hover over one of the lines that these buoys traced out over time, we can look at what's called the broadband metric. And so the broadband metric essentially tells us how much sound energy is present at that buoy's location at a particular amount of time. And you can see that across this entire period, this buoy records a fairly consistent 100 decibels of noise. Even if we aggregate this by day, we see this line to actually smooth out a little bit more. And it's definitely around 100 decibels um, every single day. And one reason for this might be is that if we talk on the shipping routes, we can actually see that this buoy uh, travels across some shipping lanes, which you can see as dark blue stripes uh, on this heat map here. Now, 100 decibels is fairly high. It's actually very close to the range where some species have been, have been found to demonstrate avoidance behavior, meaning if, when things get too loud, they start to avoid those areas. And so any additional development might be potentially risky in, in increasing the likelihood of causing avoidance behaviors. But suppose you wanted to double down and continue investigating whether or not you would your wind farms would actually truly have an impact. Now you can look at more contextual information through, this, through the biology. And so one thing you could do is turn on the detections and see what kind of species were actually detected in the recordings from this area. And so you see if I turn on a couple of, couple of detections that this buoy within the day of, October, of August 30th of 2018 detected uh, Cuvier's beaked whale several times. And so Cuvier's beaked whale is a marine mammal, and so it's protected underneath the Mar Marine Mammal Protection Act, just like all marine mammals are. Um, and so that's something important to consider when also thinking about whether or not you want to develop. If we want to get an even better understanding of what species are in the area, we can also turn on the habitat density maps. And so if we toggle on the habitat density maps, they, you see they appear as you know, this, these red heat maps. And in particular, we see that the, that the short-beaked common dolphin is very prominent in the area where this buoy is located. Now, the short-beaked common dolphin is also a marine mammal, and so protected under the same act as Cuvier's beaked whale. But neither of these species is endangered, and so in terms of development, things are looking better for us. However, we should also make sure that in different frequency ranges, we're not going to be exceeding policy limits. So for that, we can look at what are called third octave levels. Third octave levels essentially divide up the bands, divide up the frequency range uh, into different bands. And the actual metric itself is how much sound energy is present within that band. And so we see that in the lower frequency ranges, we have around 90 decibels of noise at maximum. Whereas once we get to the higher frequency ranges around 20, around 20 kilohertz, we have around 75 decibels of noise. So now is, now is the time where you can go to your policy handbook and understand what is the maximum noise threshold at each third octave level band and make sure that your, the development of your wind farms won't introduce additional noise that will cause you to exceed these thresholds. You can also make sure that you don't cause any audio masking for these species because uh, beaked whales as well as dolphins communicate and make noise in very specific ranges for their behaviors. And so if there's too much noise at a particular frequency range, you can actually mask their communication and disrupt that. And so that's something you don't want to do as a, as a resource manager. 
So after looking at all this data and synthesizing both the contextual information from the biology and the geography, as well as the uh, actual inf the anthropophony that's coming up from the shipping noise, now as you can kind of make a more general conclusion that if you were to develop a wind farm in this area uh, where this buoy is located and has been traveling, then it's going to be potentially very risky. And so you might want to look elsewhere. So there's a lot of other features on the website that unfortunately we can't cover in such a short amount of time, but I encourage you to play around with them more and also click around on other tabs of our site. Uh, one thing to note is that on the resources page, you'll find our entire literature review, which you can read through to learn even more about soundscapes. But with that, I'd love to pass it off to Lena, where she can talk about some of the risks as well as the next steps that we'll be taking. So for our next steps, our amazing literature review team submitted an abstract for an ocean conference in December. And if we're chosen, we're hoping to attend virtually to spark conversation around our visualization tool. Of course, that we also have a lot of other features in mind, and we want our next big feature to be for everyday people. We want somebody like you or me to have a walkthrough that pops up on their first visit explaining the vast tool set that CalSound provides, as well as some way to define soundscape jargon throughout the website. Our next feature would be for researchers to be able to add data to the map or request for data to be added in order to create a sense of unity and collaboration within soundscape research. Some of us will be staying on and continuing to work on these features more because once researchers can upload their own data, the site will be self-sufficient. Now, I wanna thank Anne and Noah for giving us so much of your time and resources. Thank you to the Fung Fellowship, both instructors and students for such an amazing year. And um, lastly, thank you all for listening to and about CalSound. We would love to take any questions. Well done. Um, we'll start with Anne. Anne is in the, in our, with, our, with us today. So Anne, do you have any questions or commentary you'd like to share with the group? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this is really wonderful. It's it's great to see how far you've come. The the uh, web tool is really beautiful, and it's it's fun and it's user friendly. So I've already, I've been playing with it, and I really enjoy it. So that's awesome. Um, and I'm really happy to see how you have incorporated the context of these soundscape measurements um, because that it's. You've, you've pulled that from your interviews and in all of my research, that's something that is consistently really important, whether we're talking about um, automatic classification of signals or animal behavior, context is so important. So um, I really, really appreciate how you incorporated the shipping lanes or other human activity. Or, um, that's, that's a great, those layers are really valuable. Um, I'm going to be really curious to see how we can continue to add data to this. I know that it's already, um, there's so much potential and I'd love to, to give this a life beyond this semester. Um, yeah, it's, we have a lot more data that we could add and I'd love to visualize it, see the different ways that we could visualize that as well. Um, what else? I think that's that's all I really have to say right now. I wanted to give a have a couple minutes. I also invited some of my other colleagues who are acoustic researchers at NOAA, Shannon Rankin and Corey Palm Weaver, I think are in the audience. Do either of you have anything you want to add to as feedback on this? Yeah, um, this is Shannon Rankin. I'll uh, speak up for a minute. This is great. Um, it's super exciting. You know, it's one of these things where you know, when we see how much you can do in so little time, it makes us really, really excited and we wish we could bottle you up for a year. <laughs> we could conquer the world. So it's very exciting. I love it. Um, uh, and, and I love the way the potential is. I also really appreciate how you presented it as um, a user example. Let me pretend you are someone at Boehm. I, I love that presentation also because that is exactly what we're kind of looking for. You know, us as researchers, we create products for these managers, but um, there is this gap in between what we give them and what they need to do with it. And um, they can't be professionals in every topic. So, so these kinds of tools are incredibly valuable. Um, not only are we going to share them with our stakeholders, 
But I'm going to be sharing this as an example with this other team I've been working on in, in a much larger scale of how to how do you um, bring researchers, you know, close the gap between the research and the conservation management. And so they will be very excited to see this as well. And um, so good job. Um, I love it. And, you know, of course, I'm really excited to see um, how we can bring in more of our data as somebody made a comment that the wind programs are offshore and these, this data was primarily offshore. And we're only now starting to collect data near shore. So, so it would be really great to be able to zoom in in these areas of importance to them. So, so excited for all of it. And thank you. Uh, Sam has got his hand raised. Go ahead, Sam. I think I may have still had it raised from last time, but I do actually have a question. Um, have you thought on potential markets outside of uh, and NOAA and, and government contracts, such as some of the deep, uh, deep ocean mining, oil, and other energy companies. I was even thinking maybe uh, whale watching groups as well as a, as a resource for, to help them identify proper, just kind of thinking out there beyond kind of what, what those use cases might be beyond this. Um, yeah, curious uh, your thoughts. Yeah, I can chime in on that one. I do want to acknowledge that I think when looking at the broader picture of stakeholders, there is a business model um, in almost any situation, you can make the argument that yes, you could monetize it and be profit driven in that sense. But I think for us, really our focus was within the conservation space. So working with the stakeholders that are most relevant, being researchers, um, policymakers, and really using those interviews that we um, captured and having that voice show in the work we're doing. So I think in response, while the profits can be realized, I think with an emphasis in conservation, looking at sort of what are the first steps we can take in the research space and then working from that starting point. Gotcha, so you're, you're mainly focused then on, if you're gonna move this forward on government grants and contracts or how, how are you planning on, on funding your additional, your ongoing work? Yes, so that is something that's worth exploring um, and considering those different options. But um, in the meantime, it would be something that would likely be funded by grants, nonprofit work, um, that space. Cool, thanks for that. I, I could also chime in and say that, you know, some of the industry has a responsibility to mitigate the, their activities. And so there, there could be direct funding from the industries themselves. Yeah, um, I've got a question. So first of all, shout out to the folks, I mean, you've developed, you've almost created two separate deliverables here that are of equal quality. I mean, the uh, overview and it's the lit review plus the map is just, it's a lot. So well done. Um, second of all, I have a question about buoys and um, looking at the map currently. And I'm, I was looking, I was actually reading your lit review just right now to like understand a little bit more about buoys because um, obviously, and I learned, okay, there's these drifting buoys. Are there fixed buoys? Um, is that a thing that exists? in the ocean. <laughs> I know nothing about this because I can imagine a fixed buoy also being really valuable in terms of the data it produces in a sink, like at a single point consistently over time. Yeah, I can answer this question. So there is like buoys mounted to the bottom of the ocean, um, but there are certain lim uh, some limitations to it, such as um, the ocean water can uh, only be certain depths. Uh, if it's too deep, then it would have a lot of trouble like putting it there and maintaining it uh, at the depths. Um, and also the drifting buoy is really uh, sort of like a middle ground of all the uh, marine uh, soundscape collecting data method we have right now, because um, actually the buoy doesn't drift that fast. So relatively it's in the similar region when you are collecting the sound. Um, but it's also migrating within a range that you allow it to um, migrate. So it's not fixed only at one point. Um, so it will be more flexible and cover a larger distance than um, if you put a, a hydrophone um, that is fixed at one point. Um, but you are right, there's definitely a trade-off between how large an area you can cover and um, the time you can record at a certain point. Thank you. And last question, who, 
who deploys and manages these buoys? And is there are there pushes or opportunities to deploy more over shorter intervals to get more fine-tuned, uh, finely grained data? So the data on this website is from the the NOAA CCES 2018 survey. That's the California Current Ecosystem Survey. Uh, and this was you know, provided to us by Anne, uh, which we're super thankful for. Uh, but other things that we learned from our interviews were that you know, the way that sound data is in, or data in general about the ocean is collected um, from a resource management perspective is typically on a on a need on a needs basis. And so if if for example Boehm wants to understand whether or not they whether wants to understand whether or not they should develop something, they will commission a study and then use that data. And then later on, they will commission another study to to discover the impacts of it later. So there's not really not there's not necessarily continuous monitoring or like one central source of where this data is coming from or like where these who's placing these buoys in the ocean. Okay, got it. All right, um, we have one minute left and Tyus has a short question or uh, I'm assuming a short question, but go ahead, Tyus, you have, you have the floor. Yeah, it's, it was just brief. I, I just wanna say the mapping in this is immaculate. Great job, I, I, my background is in spatial ecology. So I was just curious, just if you can clarify for me because I'm trying to figure out in my head, um, the data that you guys utilized in order to create these heat, these heat maps, and all of the indices that you guys are using, how are you guys trying, how are you guys considering the spatial and habitat corridors of what these marine mammals are navigating through? And if you have considered pre-existing versus the modern spatial extents of what they're navigating through, because you might have a heat map of like what the density of these populations are located in, but that doesn't mean that that's necessarily where, gonna, where they're gonna be in terms of migratory or breeding grounds what they're moving through without their habitat. So I was just curious like how you guys have considered that because that's like, that's a that's a kind of a, a caveat with like spatial you know, ecology that's like super important to consider. Cause if you guys, if you guys already figured it out I mean, I'd love to know cause I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And so just so without going too much into how things uh, work for, the ships in, in general, this is actually aggregated by us. And so month by month, we it'll change. Um, for the species, we actually don't have that month by month or even, you know, more regular uh, intervals uh, because this the way that these densities were computed were from models that were using survey data. Um, one, one of them was from 1991 to 2018. Wow. The other one is from 2019 specifically. But if we have models for Essentially, if we have a model for every month or every you know time interval that we want to display on the site, uh, then the slider essentially takes care of updating the heat map as you scrub over time, and so that can capture some of those migratory patterns as, as well as uh, what the actual like, corridors are. And then, in terms of, like discrete locations of animals, that's where the detections come in. And so, new models for actually figuring out what animals making a particular noise that's recorded by the buoy. And doing that in a you know timely fashion, that will be important for actually understanding uh, con concrete points of where these animals are. That's that's awesome. That's brilliant. I, that's what I was just trying to figure. Out. I was like trying to figure out the raw scale of like where your data was. If you guys were like specifically getting data from individual tagging efforts and mark and recapture, or if like it was just survey data, and then you're calculating density based on per square kilometer. So I was just curious. Like you you answered my question. I was just curious. I was wondering. I was like, are they are they tagging these animals? Is that where the data is coming from? Because that that would give you more fine skill understanding. But great job, guys. This is so cool. This is awesome. Actually, to add on to Unmol's point, the page that he's showing right now gives an explanation of the data and um, the organization that uh, it's uh, from, as well as how they collected it and all of their um, discussion and research under that. Is that in the link that you guys put in the chat too? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Cool. Thanks. I'll, I'll go. I'll do. I'll go through it in my own time. Thank you so much. Okay, we're at time. Thank you, Tyus. Um, yeah. And thank you, team. That was wonderful. You guys did a great job. And I just, again, shout out to that, both the, the, the technical team that put on that, that worked on the map, as well as the, the lit review team. I know that there was cross collaboration there as well, but good job, guys.